Uh, good afternoon. My name is Christy. As you know, I work for the University of Arizona's School of Natural Resources and the Environment, and I've been working with the CCAS team as the non-native aquatics COP coordinator for about the last year. For our first presentation today, Matt Troya and Tony Javaya, I apologize if I butchered either of your names, um, from the University of Texas at San Antonio will provide some updates on their project, surveying, modeling, and mapping non-native crayfish in the Gila and Little Colorado River basins. Um, just a reminder, if you have any questions during the presentation today, um, feel free to put them in the chat and I can relay them afterwards um, as long as we have time. And with that, I will hand it over to Matt and Tony. Thank you, Christy. Um, <clears throat> Tony, do you, uh, are you able to share your screen there and get the presentation up? Christy, do you have the capability of doing that? Should, but let me know if you do not. <laughs> let me just double check. Um, so, yeah, I think I got it, there we go, okay. All right, uh, does that look, look good? Looks good to yes. me. Sweet. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah. So thanks, Christy, for that intro. So I'm going to um, just give a, a brief overview of, of what our project is and what we've accomplished so far. And then uh, Tony Javia here is a master's student working on the project, and he's going to uh, talk a little bit more about some of the quantitative um, progress that we've made with, with the data that we've collected. So um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the folks working on this project. So that includes uh, Tony, uh, our master's student, and then uh, Jen Smith, uh, assistant professor here at UTSA, who's a, a PI on the project as well. Uh, you wanna to flip to the next one there, Tony? Thank you. Yeah, so um, we basically have three objectives for this project. Um, those being to um, do a, a comprehensive um, survey of crayfish across the Gila and Little Colorado River basins. Um, and we will be doing that for three years. Our first year is complete. That was uh, in the summer of 2021. Um, our second objective is then to use those data to build species distribution models and, and map out presence absence across uh, all the interconfluence stream reaches. Um, and then the, the third op, uh, objective is to um, do some occupancy modeling and, and try to understand correlates of uh, detection and occupancy. So uh, for today's talk, I'm just gonna give a brief overview of that first objective. And then, uh, like I said, hand it over to Tony for that second objective. And then um, hopefully in, in future updates to this group, uh, we'll be able to provide some uh, information on, on that next analysis, that objective three there. Okay, Tony. Cool, thanks. So um, we sampled uh, last May and June, 109 sites, uh, mostly in Arizona, a few in southwestern New Mexico, and then uh, distributed amongst the lower Colorado, lower uh, Gila River Basin and the Little Colorado system. So those are all nested. Those sites were nested within 11 different watersheds. Uh, so you can see the list there. Um, so pretty comprehensive as far as perennial uh, streams throughout uh, that region. Uh, next one, Tony. Um, so our, our basic study design was to um, uh, sample along these longitudinal profiles. So essentially up in the headwaters where there's a bit more spring influence and perennial water and moving down to lower elevations um, where the streams kind of peter out and uh, become more in intermittent. And then um, those 11 different watersheds uh, ideally are capturing physiographic and, and land use uh, differences. Uh, so next one there, Tony. So zooming into our sampling design, we sampled um, each site uh, for most of the 109 sites. We had 24 meter squared quadrats where we used uh, seining to just do a, a kick seine sample and uh, counted the crayfish in each of those quadrats. So we have those sort of spatial replicates nested within a site. And then e each of those, we, uh, we measured habitat as well, show some of those data in a minute. Um, and then we also put out uh, in-situ data loggers to monitor temperature and flow intermittency. Um, those are, are logging right now, so we don't have any of those data uh, available yet. Hopefully we'll, we'll uh, get a few of those back uh, this summer and, uh, 
and be able to have some of those data next time. Next one, Tony. Okay, so just to give you a little overview of what the uh, geographic and environmental coverage looked like. So we had uh, a variety of mountain streams, so Black River, Upper Little Colorado River, um, in the upper left there, uh, some desert streams, uh, lower, lower elevations in, in Southern Arizona, so San Pedro River, for example, in the upper right. Uh, we had a few plateau streams, so Little Colorado River main stem, um, sort of in North Central, Arizona, and then we also had some uh, urban sites as well in, in the Tucson area and some of the other smaller municipalities in Arizona. Next, Tony. So here's uh, uh, an overview of all the crayfish that we captured. Um, we captured and counted over 10,000 crayfish, um, which is kind of unfortunate, but many of you probably wouldn't be surprised at, at that uh, high number. 65% uh, of our sites uh, had crayfish. So I think it was about 70 out of 109. Um, and then there's just a histogram showing the, the number of crayfish captured um, at each of those sites. And so most cray, most sites were, were relatively low uh, densities of, of, the, of captures. Um, some we, we captured quite a few over, over 600 individuals within uh, just 24 meter square quadrats. All right, next one, Tony. Um, so this is just a really brief overview of some of the habitat measurements. Um, so we, we did a total of 2,573 individual quadrats across those 109 sites and measured things like uh, depth shown on the top there, and covered a range of depths um, within weightable streams, um, a variety of substrate diameters. We also measured current velocity, a variety of different habitat types. Um, so a lot of data that, um, that we'll be able to use um, to understand occupancy and detection. Uh, next one, Tony. And then, of course, um, we've been integrating uh, these data with uh, a lot of open source GIS data to, um, to do that modeling and mapping of, of species distributions. Um, and that uh, offers a good opportunity to transition to uh, Tony, who's going to talk about some of those GIS analyses. Sweet. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, yep. So as Matt said, um, I'll be taking over that second objective and um, dive into some of the species distribution modeling that we've been working on. Um, so I'm going to subset um, my into two main questions. Uh, so the first is, you know, just a general, um, what is like the distribution of viral crayfish in our study region? And um, so to do that, we use an ensemble approach of using general linearized models, uh, general additive models and random forests. Um, I'll dive into those a little bit more when I get into the, metho uh, the methods. And then a second question that we've been working on a little bit more recently is um, looking at how those environmental factors relate to one another and um, how they're important to um, creating crayfish distribution models. So, you know, comparing natural and anthropogenic uh, variables in um, different random forests. And so that's, uh, that's what we'll dive into after the first point. Um, and so first I'll start a little bit on the mythology. So as I mentioned, uh, we use species distribution modeling or SDMs. Um, and so essentially that uses uh, three main points. So, you know, first like Matt covered, we did field surveys um, to collect presence and absence uh, for each of those sites. And we're then able to link those uh, to environmental data. Um, so each of those sites have a unique com ID and uh, we use StreamCat for our data source to uh, download a number of environmental variables, which we then linked um, to those sites by ComID. And so once we have that, we're able to use that data to fit and predict a niche. And um, that created niche can then generate spatial predictions of potential distributions. Um, and so I mentioned earlier, we used an ensemble approach of using those three different algorithms. And so uh, one of the benefits of using three, right, is that you have um, a better average on potential distributions and a better estimates of uncertainty uh, than any one model alone can provide. Um, and so before I dive into uh, each of the models, I just want to give you guys a brief overview of the model performance um, and how these three stacked up with one another. Um, and so we evaluated model performance by using area under the curve or AUC of the receiver operator characteristic. Um, so AUC essentially measures the ability to dis uh, discriminate between true positives and false positives. So in other words, how good is these models at um, correctly predicting presence versus um, falsely predicting presence? Um, and so as I show here, our GAM had an AUC score about 0 0.8. Our GLM had one about 
0.81 and our random forest was 0.83. Um, so typically, you know, for publications, uh, anything about 0.75, 0 0.8 and above um, is typically considered adequate performance. Um, so that's right around where we're hovering right now. And uh, future directions, we're going to try and get uh, those scores a little bit higher. Um, so I'll start off with the general linearized model. Um, so as I show here, uh, areas that had a predicted presence of greater than 0 0.5 were uh, shown in black and uh, areas that were not are shown in grayscale. And so we predicted presence uh, out of the 5,500 so uh, perennial streams, about 69.4%. And there's about 84,832 uh, 84, um, intermittent streams and we predicted presence in about 46.9% of those. Um, and for the GAM, it's pretty similar as you see, we predicted presence in about 68.1% perennial streams and about 34.1% in intermittent streams. And for the random forest, as you can see, it's a little bit more restricted there. Our predicted presence was 54.7% in perennial streams and 20.2% in intermittent streams. And so I added the slides, so you can sort of see how they compare um, each with pretty high rates of prediction um, up in those mountainous regions and um, the random forest is a little bit more restricted than the other two um, in the down southern west region. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, one of the benefits of using multiple algorithms is that you're allowed to get an ensemble average and that's what I've shown here. So we predicted on average about 68.5% in perennial streams and about 37.7% uh, in intermittent streams. Um, and we're also, uh, we also calculated the habitat uh, uh, model uncertainty by taking the standard deviation across the three models, um, which are shown there in the left corner. Um, as you see, the, the area um, that are in darker gray is where there's more model uncertainty and areas that are lighter is where there's less. Um, so that mountainous region that I mentioned earlier, there's a little bit less uncertainty there than there are in regions where um, there's differences between the, the GLM, GAM, and random forest. Um, so that's kind of giving you an overview of the predictions on um, distribution of the crayfish. And so um, now I can tackle that second question, uh, which is, you know, comparing those environmental factors. So to do that, we created two different random forest models, um, one with only natural variables and one with only anthropogenic variables and compare the two. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, we use AAC to evaluate model performance. Um, you can see there the natural variables was about 0 0.845 and the anthropogenic variables was just around about 0 0.7. Um, and so here's the first one with natural variables only. Um, so predicted presence was 56.7% and 24.8% in perennial and intermittent respectively. And then so what I put up there in the, in the left bottom corner, um, is the uh, percent forest rating across the entire uh, habitat region. Um, so areas that are darker have a higher uh, percent forest. And so you can sort of see that uh, percent forest um, is a pretty highly correlated variable in terms of uh, the model. Uh, those two areas overlap pretty closely. Um, and so with the anthropogenic predictive variables, we predicted presence in 69.4% of perennial areas and 46.9% uh, of intermittent. And uh, same thing, um, the bottom left corner is uh, the road density within watershed across that region. Um, so that was the most important variable uh, for that model, which you can see they have pretty similar overlaps in um, comparison there. And so as I mentioned, uh, there is a way to calculate the vari variable importance in random forests. And so one way to do that is by calculating the mean decrease in Gini. Uh, so essentially, the higher, the greater that value is, the more important that variable is the model. Um, and so on the left hand side, we have the variables that I use for the natural uh, random forest. On the right, it's for the anthropogenic random forest. Um, so on the left hand side, the most important variables were the wetness uh, index within the watershed, the percent forest, which I mentioned, uh, as well as the mean organic content per watershed. Uh, so these all sort of deal with uh, habitat requirements um, in terms of like wetness and uh, vegetation. And on the right hand side, so these are all anthropogenic, but the two most um, important variables were road density within the watershed and population density. Um, so these are, you know, surrogates of um, how often people are interacting with those habitats. So those seem to be driving um, predictions for those models. Um, so that wraps up for species distributions that, that we've done so far, um, but to just highlight some of the future directions, I know Matt has alluded to some of those, but some of the other ones that we plan on working on is adding additional models. So 
Um, you have things like booster regression trees to sort of get a more cohesive and complete um, ensemble approach. And there's always opportunities to incorporate additional predictor variables and sort of see if those can um, impact our predictions. And then lastly, there's also opportunities to create different variable combinations with variables we already have and sort of see how those affect AUC scores and predictions across the region. Uh, and I think uh, we also have our uh, acknowledgement slides. Um, and I think I, I can open it up for questions now if we have uh, time for those. Awesome, thank you, Tony and Matt, um, for the great presentation. Are there any questions? Feel free to put them in the chat, or um, I think since we don't have many right now, you could probably unmute. Uh, we do have one, one question um, we'll get started with. Have you noticed any surprises in the strongest or weakest predictors of crayfish presence? Um, that's a good question. Um, let's see, I can pull up those, uh, just pull up that variable real quick. Um, one second. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess one of them would be the, the amino organic content. I wasn't exactly sure, you know, um, how highly correlated that would be in terms of a predicted presence. Um, but the top ones that sort of did make sense to me, you know, things like percent forest, because um, I mean, Matt can tell you when we were sampling those sites, a lot of the ones that had like, you know, really abundant fish uh, across the sites were in forest regions. Um, so this kind of made sense as did, um, you know, areas that were heavily populated by people, but um, I'd say you're getting content. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I see a raised hand. Um, if you want to just unmute and ask your question. Yeah. Um, hey, Tony. Um, this is Javin Bowder from the Arizona Co-op Unit. Um, great presentation. And uh, I was really curious to see, um, it looked like your GAMs and GLMs had higher predicted presence in kind of Southwest Arizona um, compared to the random forest model. And I was just curious why you think that might be the case. Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, as I was talking to Matt about that earlier today, um, so I, I think one of the reasons why is uh, sort of the assumptions that our, our data make um, random forests are a little bit more robust against those. Um, and so I, I think that in likelihood, our random forest, along with the AC score being better, is probably a better representation of uh, what predicted presence um, is. Great, okay, I'm gonna back up in the chat here. Um, question about, are you planning to work in or have you worked in the members drainage? Uh, there's a crayfish, uh, Chiricahua leopard frog conflict there at a restoration site. And I'm currently working with Leland Pierce and an intern and some others on a case study. So we're just wondering about that area. Uh, Matt, I think you would probably have a better idea of the exact sites on that one. Yeah, so when we were um, developing this proposal, uh, Mimbris was was sort of in our list of candidate sub-basins that we wanted to do, but we ended up um, uh, focusing on the other 11. So I, I guess the short answer is um, no, we're not planning on, on getting there, unfortunately. Um, the plan for the next two years is to sample uh, the same 109 sites, kind of get at that question of, uh, interannual variability in, in crayfish uh, detection, occupancy, and abundance. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, another question here in the chat says, looks like you applied the models outside of the Gila and Little Colorado basins where cray crayfish were collected. Are you still predicting within the environmental space represented by the streams where crayfish data were collected? Yeah, it's a great question. And so um, currently, you know, with these preliminary models that we ran, um, yeah, they are using the context of 109 sites to then predict those niches. Um, but we have teased out, you know, sort of restricting that range within watersheds that we have sampled. Um, and so I think in the future, that's a, that's a very good question and um, point to sort of restrict that back to sites that we've been sampling and within those watersheds. Great, thank you. Um, one more question in the chat. Have you incorporated time of year in your analyses as um, 
crayfish populations vary seasonally. Yeah, um, exactly. And so um, this was a first year of our project when we seasoned um, last summer. And so it's part of a first year out of a three year project. Um, so we'll be going back out there this summer and next um, to sample the exact same sites and sort of look at, you know, those um, interseason variation from year to year. And so this will definitely be incorporated. So um, a good benefit of this product will get both, you know, these uh, tease out these questions on both a spatial and a temporal scale. So definitely. Sounds great. Are there any other questions? Christy, this is Matt, I'll add a question. Um, I was just thinking about some of the reservoirs and you know other systems in Arizona. So do you feel like the models you're creating for the streams would be applicable to some of those, uh, to different types of water bodies, I guess, um, kind of more broadly? Um, as in mapping these on like outside of streams as in like lakes and um, open body water, is that, is that what you're referring to? So I'm thinking of like reservoirs or standing bodies of water in addition to streams. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, yeah. So there, there definitely is an opportunity, um, you know, to use these if you had a large enough um, scale of surveys, then predict that out. I, I can add something, uh, something to that too. So we, we've been um, working a little bit with Jeff Sorensen, and he's been gracious enough to supply a lot of data. Um, and I don't remember exactly the sites that he provided data for, but there may be some. Uh, Lentic water body sites. Um, so it's something that we could definitely do in the coming months is fit our models with our data and, and see how well they they predict uh, presence, absence, and some of those different types of uh, habitats. Um, we'd probably have to make some changes to the, the variables we're using so they're not uh, stream network type variables, but things like temperature, precipitation, uh, land cover would all still be um, transferable from one habitat type to the other. I see uh, uh, Julian's question there. Um, yeah, so we originally, when we were writing this proposal um, and when we were out there, we were expecting to find um, from Barkis Clarky as well as the rusty crayfish. But um, in the sites that we sampled, we actually only ended up finding the owl crayfish. Sweet. Uh, yeah, thank you. That, that would be great. I think more data, the better. Um, I can send my email um, in the chat down there. Awesome. Got time for maybe one or two more questions if people have them. All right, not seeing or hearing anything else. So I think we'll go ahead and move on to the next presentation for the sake of time. Uh, but thank you again, Tony and Matt. That was an excellent presentation. Really, really interesting research to hear about. So thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Yeah. And um, for our next presentation, uh, the MIMS lab from Virginia will provide some updates on the Smart Sim project which is an effort to model bullfrog and Arizona tree frog metapopulations in Southern Arizona. So I will go ahead and turn it over to them. And let me know if you need any host permissions. Thank you so much, Christy. I'm gonna share now and we'll see if we can get this working. Okay, hopefully everybody can see this all right and hopefully you can hear me. If not, please feel free to unmute um, and just let me know as I go through. So um, hi everyone, it's great to see all of your names on the screen. I'm Meryl Mims, I'm an assistant professor at Virginia Tech. Um, and today I'm gonna give you an update on our project called SmartSim. Uh, this is in collaboration with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the Forest Service and many, many other partners throughout the region. And today I'm presenting on behalf of the lab. So the work that I'm showing you here, um, of course, is things I've been involved with, but this is really hugely in thanks to Grace O'Malley, Daryl Trumbo, and Joe Drake. So Grace is a first year PhD student in my lab and Daryl and Joe are both postdocs. 
So uh, what I'm going to share, the work I'm going to share with you is really about um, bullfrogs and really thinking about how do we consider sort of um, strategic and, um, and uh, really sort of systematic strategies for removal of this pest that's widely distributed throughout the Western U.S. We know that they're a major challenge for aquatic species uh, throughout the American West. They're a disease vector, they're a voracious predator, um, and we've seen lots of investment in sort of local scale to regional scale operations for removal uh, with varying levels of success, uh, some even regional programs being very successful. What we also know is that there's still a lot of limitations in terms of the resources that are out there and how much we can invest in uh, removal uh, efforts. And so that sort of leads us to this challenge of can we take a strategic removal approach to control and removal of bullfrogs uh, and really for any invasive species and to do that what does it really take if we want to think about this sort of strategic approach and so when we think about this and sort of going over this with, with our partners on this project there were a few key parts of information that kind of came to the forefront one is that we first and foremost need spatial information. So where are these uh, invasive species? What types of environments are they using? How do they move around? It's useful to have information on their population dynamics or meta population dynamics if that's how um, they exist and persist. It's also really useful to have information on environmental variability. So what's happening with, for example, for aquatic invasives um, with surface water availability and how might that change through time? And then finally, we often want to know how do these invasive species interact with and maybe threaten uh, native aquatic species as well. So these, this sort of question of could we do this and what would it take is what really set the stage for our project called SmartSim, which stands for Simulating Meta Populations and Removal Tactics for Strategic Invasives Management. One of the things that really drew us to this call um, and sort of um, made us really excited about potentially tackling this is that many of those pieces of information that I just talked about, we actually have for a region of um, Southern Arizona. And so that includes the information on uh, sort of what's happening with environmental variability through time, where species are distributed. We have some information thanks to population genetics on metapopulation dynamics. We know a little bit about species interactions, particularly co-occurrences. And this is an area um, that I'll introduce in a second where we have active bullfrog removal that's been going on for um, years and years. And so this, again, uh, what I'm going to present today is really a, a, a partnership with our team from Virginia Tech, as well as uh, individuals from many different agencies um, and throughout the region. So just to sort of give you a roadmap of where we are, I sort of use this we are here tracker, uh, mostly to remind myself, are we doing everything that we said we would do? Uh, and so uh, I wanna sort of bring folks on the call up to speed on what we've done thus far and what the next steps are. And I'm gonna structure this in terms of sort of our three main objectives and talk mostly about objective one, get into the plans and what's happening right now for objective two, uh, and then end briefly with objective three. So we'll start with objective one, which is really about the empirical data collection on this project. So the first thing we had to do was, um, you know, this is a project where we knew we were really interested in the invasion of this um, non-native species of the American bullfrog into ponds. These are mostly man-made ponds in this region of the Coronado National Forest. So this is the Huachuca uh, EMA sort of shown here on the map. And we've got our inset just to orient folks who are not familiar with the Huachuca Mountains or Canelo Hills. And so in this region, there are hundreds of ponds. Many of them are man-made and were originally for livestock and are now um, sort of surrogate habitat for many uh, native aquatic species that have been otherwise displaced. So um, lots of federally threatened or listed species that are there, as well as some that are species of state um, concern, uh, including the Arizona tree frog in the region, which exists in sort of this isolated cluster of populations uh, in this portion of its range. And so what really sort of fascinated us about this is that we have this opportunity not only to sort of influence uh, on the ground conservation operations, but also to think about this as sort of a test ground where we can sort of run computer simulations, but then also incorporate um, empirical data as well, some of which that we already had and some that we're collecting that I'll tell you about. So in order to select these ponds, what we knew we wanted were ponds that were within this Huachuca EMA. And ideally that sort of uh, were within the area where we know uh, bullfrogs uh, either have been or continue to um, sort of remain as well as sort of that Arizona tree frog historical distribution. So you can see that here uh, in red and blue. We were also interested in a range of ponds. So including ponds that were both permanent 
and that were intermittent. And so this is a um, figure from a paper that we published in 2020 that shows uh, just simple Google Earth imagery. So for any of you who've ever played around with this, probably most of you have, you can go into Google Earth Pro and um, sort of scale back through time with historical imagery. And this is actually, it can provide really high resolution imagery um, that's sort of opportunistically taken through time of some of the ponds in the region. So this is an example of one here, 75 tank. You can see sort of this time series of when it had water and when it didn't. So some of the ponds are intermittent like this. We know those are important for bullfrogs potentially as stepping stones, or if they do hold water for more than a year at a time, um, they can be recruitment uh, sites as well. And I put a little asterisk for permanent because many of the ponds we included, as many of you know, from the just um, ongoing historic drought in the region, some of the ponds that we presumed were permanent uh, last year, we uh, learned were not. And so that was sort of part of the story that I'll get to here in a second as well. So that led us to these 48 study ponds that we have selected. And so these are shown in the, the gray points throughout the region. And um, all of these ponds are outfitted with dual channel acoustic recorders, which give us information on whether or not uh, Arizona tree frogs or bullfrogs are calling. This is a picture of one from Upper Tank um, taken on May 3rd of last year. And uh, these are dual channels. So again, it looks like the microphone here is pointing away from the pond, but if you look really closely, there's another microphone on the other side pointing to the pond. Some of these ponds also, about 25 of them that are intermittent, have temperature sensors that give us fairly precise measurements of inundation timing. So this tells us during the monsoon season when these ponds fill up with water. And so there's a paper that we, this is sort of a shameless plug here, but this is a paper we just uh, published in uh, late last year where we described the methodology that we use to, to use these temperature sensors to tell us about hydro period and inundation timing. So the, the photo here of the pond is, um, you can see, maybe you can kind of see there's this uh, rock um, pile in the middle and there's actually a pond sensor in there. They're, they're sort of enclosed in these PVC housing units with a pendant logger in the middle. And then uh, we use um, a concrete tied to drive uh, completely into the ground so that they don't um, so that they stay put essentially. And so you can compare the pond and the control sensor and that gives us um, essentially a, a signal of when water fills um, the pond because once water comes in and sort of uh, inundates that temperature sensor, the daily variation in temperature really plummets compared to air temperature. So that's the signal that we're looking for. So if anybody is interested in this paper, please let me know, I'm happy to send out um, a preprint as well. So in terms of that, some of the data that we had that we're continuing to collect, uh, I also want to highlight just a few, um, some preliminary results from the acoustic data, which are really exciting. And we're continuing to get this, these uh, preliminary results every single uh, day. And then I want to talk a little bit about where we are with bullfrog removal and genomic analysis. So we'll start with the acoustic data collection analysis and preliminary results. And this is largely thank to, thanks to Grace O'Malley, who's down here in the lower left. Um, Grace has really spearheaded a lot of this work in the lab. So um, the, for the acoustics, I wanna just go over quickly what these recorders are and how we've set them up. So we are using uh, wildlife acoustic song meter minis with uh, rechargeable batteries. So this is sort of a modification that you can add to them. These are made by wildlife acoustics and they enable passive acoustic monitoring. And you can basically set them to um, record 24 hours a day or for certain times of the day. And what we've done, which is shown here at the bottom is we've set them up to record for 12 hours a day centered around the sunrise and the sunset. Um, you know, and the main thing for us, we're interested mostly in those evening hours, but we went ahead and recorded um, the daytime hours as well, because we know that bullfrogs occasionally will call during the day. Not occasionally, sometimes it's quite common. Um, the other uh, thought here is that this is going to be, you know, sort of a, a scale um, of sort of this acoustic monitoring array that could enable other ecological questions with these ponds, um, everything from sort of birds to other animals that uh, may be calling insects and others. So we wanted to capture that sunrise time as well. So the acoustic data can then be evaluated manually just by going through and sort of looking at the data, like what you can see on the right hand side. So here it's fairly clear looking at the, the frequency of these calls. These are both five second recordings. You can see a single bullfrog on the top um, calling you know, by himself. And then on the bottom, this is a really active uh, Arizona tree frog chorus that was, uh, that was recorded. So both of these are sort of visualizations of those outputs. 
Um, but essentially, uh, that would be sort of a manual evaluation. What you can also do is sort of train identifiers or classifiers for specific species. And that's exactly what we've done. So Grace has worked um, with an awesome undergrad researcher in our team, Charlotte Turry, and they have built uh, these simple classifiers for both bullfrogs and tree frogs using Kaleidoscope uh, Pro. And then they go through once those calls are flagged and screen them to make sure it's an accurate call. And so in terms of the performance to date, so last year we launched uh, 50 of these recorders um, across the range of these sites. Uh, this is an inset of sort of one of the recorders. It's kind of a challenge maybe um, to see if you guys can see the recorder. It's um, just to the left of the label here for perch tank in a tree. Um, and so essentially these were first put out for two months. We, you know, these are built to be outdoors, they're fairly hardy, but we still were not quite sure what uh, the success rate would look like. And from that initial deployment, we only had two of 50 recorders fail, and that was due to moisture in the units just from an issue of how they were deployed. So that's something we've addressed. So we were quite happy, uh, happy sorry, with that success rate. Um, and so they were left to record during the monsoon, and we have basically the first few, um, the first couple of months of the monsoon season, we will be picking up the late summer uh, recordings through basically October, um, just next month. Uh, the other thing that's really cool with sort of the preliminary data that we found, um, I guess it's, I don't know if cool is the right word, but um, that's interesting to see is that we've already identified one case at least of recolonization by bullfrogs. Um, this is an example of Collins Tank, and I'm going to kind of get into this here in a second. I wanted to point out for anybody familiar with the region, this is about 3.6 kilometers from Parker Canyon Lake. So um, just sort of uh, upstream with a drainage that directly collects uh, connects to the lake and we know that that is certainly a source um, of, of bullfrogs. There's quite a few there in the lake, so something to keep in mind. So for Collins Tank, um, this was a, a site that we visited. Um, I was out there in May of last year and so this was an area um, that both John Kraft uh, and Justin Sober had targeted uh, for both bullfrog removal. And in this case, that was mostly to collect uh, tissue samples for us for genomics, but this was also a tank that they were actually able to drain. And so you can see here on May 1st, um, there's an arrow there pointing to the, the pumping equipment. Um, I know that uh, Justin had some issues with bears getting into it from um, time to time. So I don't think it was running that day, but that's essentially, you can see the, um, the, the pipes there. And then, um, there's a picture uh, to the right of some active removal. So this is through um, shooting. So that's what that picture is. And then as you go down, you can see, you know, in June, June 24th, so before the rains came, this pond was completely dry. Um, Justin had visited multiple times. There was no sort of evidence at that point of bullfrogs being uh, nearby. It was, um, again, completely dried up. And then this is what it looked like after the monsoon um, rains. So on August 8th. And uh, what Grace has found, the acoustic data, so this is sort of a few different tanks here just to orient you. Um, the tank labels are shown here uh, on the left of sort of this, this graph with these um, vertical um, uh, bars. These are sort of almost like a, it's, it's a time series essentially of each one of these tanks. And so Collins tank is shown there in, um, in bold. And what we found was that by uh, July 30th, bullfrogs were calling again at this tank. So again, this is not so, so far from the um, from Parker Canyon Lake, but if um, we're correct in assuming that that was the potential source, that gives us some information on, um, on um, mobility and on uh, potential recolonization dynamics here. So we're really excited uh, to dig further into these data. At this point, um, and Charlotte's been a major help for this, so Grace has led this effort and Charlotte's really helped us out. We have um, over nine at this point, I think we're still working on it, of the 48 ponds um, for 2021 are processed. And uh, Charlotte and Grace and a few others also made it completely through processing preliminary data from 2018 and 19 as well. So um, every single day we're sort of adding to this data set. The other thing that was really interesting to me, and this is you know, super preliminary, so we'll, I'm excited to see if this holds, but as you might notice with the ponds that have been analyzed thus far, um, most of these either have, or they either have tree frogs that have called or they have bullfrogs. We haven't yet uncovered a case of um, both species calling at the same tank. So that's certainly something that we're interested to continue to, to scan for. Okay, so I wanna switch gears real quick and tell you a little bit about where we are for genomic analysis uh, and bullfrog removal as well. So we, as part of this project, are um, 
doing sort of a, an experimental approach here using landscape genomics to try to understand um, the metapopulation dynamics of this invasive species. In our case, we do have temporal replication, which really helps uh, in terms of the ability to potentially uncover uh, population dynamics in this, um, in, among the populations within this region. We are also using a double digest rad seq or DD rad. And this is important because in the past, the use of population genetics on invasive species um, has been a little bit frowned upon just because uh, you can imagine in many cases, it's only a few individuals that get established. You have these sort of founder effects where there's not a lot of genetic diversity and it can be really hard to get useful information. Well, sort of in the era of landscape genomics, that's starting to change. And we've gone from you know, tens of markers to tens of thousands of them using um, techniques like this. And I should say, this is all led by uh, Dr. Daryl Trumbo in our lab. And Daryl is um, absolutely an expert on this. And he's worked with cane toads uh, as well in Australia. So certainly very um, cued into sort of this, this approach. So ultimately, what we want to um, try to do is uh, uncover population uh, genetics and structure, and then think about how um, those, those uh, structures and patterns of structure are related to landscape factors that may either restrict or enhance bullfrog movement um, and really give us some insight on what's going on at a landscape scale. So for the removal efforts in 2021, there's sort of two different things that are happening here. One is removal and sort of control. So you can think about that from a very applied sort of management um, context or conservation context. For us, we were also very interested in getting those tissues. So there was a, um, I just wanna be clear here that the numbers I'm showing are about the, uh, that I'm about to show are about the tissue collections. There were many, many more individuals that were actually removed. Um, we only need up to about 50 individuals per population. So something to keep in mind. Um, the leads on this were John Kraft and Justin Stober, and I labeled us as the Virginia Tech recovery team um, because we have, because the, the permits that are required for this and the protocols um, are fairly unique, uh, and this is sort of maybe a topic for a different time. Um, we've had to work closely with IACUC here on campus, but the great news is that the vets have been super supportive and we should have our protocol in place uh, for this upcoming season, which is really exciting. Um, but we did a lot of watching last year. Uh, so what 2021 amounted to was sort of a race against drying ponds. You know, it was an extremely dry year. You can see from the photos here, many of these ponds um, were ones that were, you know, that we've not really seen dry before or that dry only very, very infrequently. Um, and so there was sort of, Justin was really, even though we knew that when those ponds dry, that effectively um, can induce removal or control on its own. We wanted those genetic samples. And so Justin was really sort of racing against those ponds. Um, uh, he also, again, uh, there was pumping to, to sort of drain the ponds um, where possible, where that made sense with um, grazing activity and other considerations. Where there was active removal, that was done through gigging, through shooting, or through seining. And, and Justin has come up with uh, sort of some specific protocols for various removal tactics. And I do want to note that that sort of uh, that, that those approaches are going to be their own product out of this uh, out, out of this effort. So there will be a training circular, lots of details about what worked, what didn't. And so I'm not getting into that today. But Justin has extremely meticulous notes on sort of the efficiency, the cost all the pieces sort of associated with those efforts. So these are the, the, again, the tissue samples that we were able to collect in 2021. Um, so despite the drought, it was a good year for, for samples for us. So you can see that what we tried to do is not only look at sites within that core distribution of our study ponds, but also get a few that were sort of outside as well. And that'll really help us put our, um, the, the tissue samples that we have into context of sort of that broader region. So there were uh, 626 samples total over 26 sites. And then I have this note here for sites with over five, which is really what we wanna see for population genetic analysis. Uh, there were 18, which is really, um, we were really happy with that. What's also super exciting is that we actually have tissue samples from about a decade, over a decade ago, which I hate saying because it makes me feel very old. <laughs> but these are from 2010 and 2011 when I had just started doing PhD work in this region. Um, and so we held on to them. It's a big thanks to Julian Olden at the University of Washington, who's my PhD advisor, for keeping them in the lab for 10 years. We just got, the, got those to, you, um, to uh, Virginia Tech this year. And so we have samples uh, as well. And what's going to be really cool about that is to compare 
uh, how genetic diversity either has changed or hasn't um, at sites within that core part of the distribution. So for those of you who were active on this project back in the day, this was work from Glenn Frederick um, from Arizona Fishing Game and others. Okay, so just to um, kind of give you a sense of where we are with this. So the timeline for sort of spring and summer of 2022 uh, is that we have um, the first Bullfrog DDRAD library has been submitted. Um, we have 48 individuals from 27 sites and two to three individuals per site, which will give us a really good sense of, um, kind of what we're looking at for genetic um, structure and for diversity as well. Uh, Daryl's working to align the DDRAD reads to the bullfrog reference genome and also to analyze depth of coverage, which are important as we move forward. We'll then continue to build the next DDRAD libraries and work on some initial population and landscape genomics analyses. Do want to note that these we should have these data any day now. We were really hoping to have them for this call, but um, we've got just a little bit of a backlog with the folks that we're contracting with for that. So absolutely no problem. Maybe on the next call, we can give you uh, some data, uh, preliminary data on that. Uh, removal efforts will resume soon as well. And then for summer, for the summer, uh, we will move into sort of formal landscape genetic analyses of those historical samples and the 2021 samples. Um, and then we'll continue the analysis as they come in as well. And so I'm not going to spend nearly as much time on this one, but I do want to just give you a quick update on where we are with objective two. Um, and so this is with our simulations. And so the goal of this part of the project is really bringing all of this together into a simulation platform that is data driven, um, that is sort of informed by the landscape and that allows us to consider multiple dynamic components, including metapopulation dynamics, climate change and various management strategies. Um, Joe Drake, who's a, who is a uh, postdoc in the lab is really the one spearheading this effort as well. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the simulation platform that we're using. It's called Hexim. And one of the neat things about this platform is that it enables us to incorporate all sorts of environmental variables, including uh, anthropogenic features, uh, canopy cover, riparian corridors, really any number of things that are valuable or that may be important to the organisms that you want to simulate and how they interact with the landscape. The landscapes can also be either static or dynamic. And uh, Hexen gets its name because those landscapes are then converted into this hexagonal landscape that enables sort of more realistic movements of simulated organisms as they move from hexagon to hexagon. And each one of those um, hexagons uh, has values that are associated with biological functions such as vital rates, movement probability, um, other things along those lines. And this is a schematic of um, a hexa model that is days away from being submitted. I was, again, so hopeful that I could put um, submitted here, but um, days away. Uh, so this, and I'm happy to share the preprint with anybody who, who's interested or wants to get into the, to the details. Uh, but this is a schematic here of what um, our hexa model looks like that we've already built for the Arizona tree frog. And it looks fairly complex, but this one, um, it, we could certainly make it even more complex if we wanted to. The main thing I wanted to show here is that there's sort of these main components components that, um, that capture things like movement, reproduction, and metamorphosis, overwinter and growth, and mortality. And then there's sort of this function where you can continue to run the model for as many time steps or years uh, as you'd like. And so once this model is built and parameterized, you can test things like management scenarios of things like bullfrogs, um, and also incorporate dynamic portions of the landscape, like the response of aquatic environments to climate change. And that's exactly what we've done with the Arizona tree frog as we're trying to simulate how this species might respond to reduced aquatic habitat. This is an example of some of the outputs that you can receive. So in this case, um, or that you can generate. So in this case, uh, this is showing the percent years uh, given pond recruits individuals um, of the Arizona tree frog with sort of baseline values. So this is parameterized by historical Google Earth images of when ponds are wet or dry. And then we simulated reductions in uh, hydroperiod availability or in pond availability based on um, what we expect might happen under climate change and what's really already happening. And so this is sort of an example um, that's mapped of what one of these outputs might look like. And outputs can also include movement data, uh, demography, and uh, genetics as well. And some simulation scenarios that we might be particularly interested in as we modify this model and expand it to include bullfrogs uh, may be uh, specifically in the landscape, the addition of permanent ponds, like, like what's happened in the region with this example from um, 80 tank, which was converted to permanent pond recently. It's a picture of it from May 2nd. 
Um, we could also think about the removal of permanent ponds or conversion to intermittent ponds if they are um, identified as a major source for bullfrogs. We can think about management of particular risk zones, uh, including control or removal at specific sources, or even thinking about targeting buffered areas where we know those are likely sort of avenues for um, bullfrogs to come into the region. And then finally, we can compare the costs versus the outcomes of these different uh, approaches. So this is all stuff that we are really excited to dig into with this model. And the last thing that I do, you know, just want to make sure it doesn't get sort of overlooked is that, of course, we care a lot about testing out these different bullfrog um, management um, approaches, but we want to do this in the context of climate change. And that's because climate change is likely to reduce aquatic habitat and intensify interactions among aquatic species. And so simulations like the use of HEXM really allow us to have this powerful tool that um, enables comparison of sort of management futures in light of these really um, complex and interacting processes in ways that we really can't go out and sort of experiment with empirically on the landscape. So this can be a very powerful tool to think about what those futures might look like. Um, and just a shout out to the recent Park Williams paper, which I'm sure everybody has seen and is all over the news, um, really, again, just underscoring how important it is to, to think about these things in the context of climate change. So last slide here, this is for our third objective, which we're really just starting to, um, this has sort of been embedded throughout, but we're really starting to think about the workshop actively now. Um, so we are continuing to actively seek feedback from any of you about um, input or thoughts on genetic, our genomic and acoustic analyses, parameterization of the model. If there's things you'd really love to see, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and we have been meeting with key stakeholders already, but if you'd like to join in those smaller meetings, of course, just reach out and, and let us know. You can reach out to me or to Joe. Um, in 2023, so next um, summer, we're going to be sort of bringing all this together and hosting a workshop at the um, Appleton uh, Waddell Research Ranch. And so uh, there, what we're hoping to do is go over the findings, the limitations and the transferability of this particular approach, uh, including letting others um, possibly take a stab at applying it to their own systems and helping with that. So we'll be recruiting and planning for that soon. So please um, keep an eye out and yeah, let us know if you'd be interested in joining. We'll be working on that soon. And that is all I have for now. So I'm going to stop sharing and move back to the main group. Okay. Thanks so much, Meryl, for another um, excellent and really interesting presentation. Um, really great work that you're doing. Um, so let's, uh, I'll open it up. We have just a few minutes if anyone has questions. Like before, feel free to, to raise your hand or unmute or put them in the chat. Um, we have one question um, asking about how much the audio recorders cost. Yeah, so um, those are, let's see if I can if I can get the numbers right. And Grace, if you're on here, please feel free um, to let me know if I'm getting it wrong. <laughs> so the recorders, I think, are in the neighborhood of $450. And then there's a modified lid that allows for lithium ion batteries, which is what we chose to do um, because it increases the recording length. And so, and then you also have to factor in the um, SD cards as well for, for um uh, for recording the actual data. And so all in all, I think it was in the neighborhood of around um, $600 for everything. Grace, how far off am I? Uh, I was going to say about $750 per oh. unit. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, optimistic. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah. the more we buy in bulk, um, the cheaper it gets. So that made it a bit more cost effective. So Debbie, I see your question here. How effective was the um, auto analysis? So that's a great question. That's part of what we're digging into now. So Grace and Charlotte are using these um, simple identifiers, but we have sort of these independent um, manually scored data sets as well to try to, to answer that question and get a sense of our error rates. So I don't know, um, uh, I don't have an answer for you quite yet, but that is something that we absolutely want to try to, uh, to, to get a handle on. Thus far, it seems to be working really well. And Grace, I don't know if you want to say anything about the sort of the hit rate on those. Yeah, so we essentially build these simple classifiers um, and run them on the data from the sites, uh, and they help uh, kind of narrow down what files to look at. Um, so we can go in and um, manually verify those 
Um, and then also we can dig into those files if we want to get more specific um, information about the calling. Um, I see another question about how difficult was it to differentiate between the species. Um, super easy. Uh, you, the classifiers, um, there's a learning curve, but once you figure them out, um, they're pretty good and pretty effective. Yeah, so this is Debbie, if I may. Does anybody hear me? No, okay. Yes, yeah, we, we can, can hear you. We can hear you, Debbie. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. I don't usually say anything. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know because, you know, I do use ARUs with, with amphibians and other species, and uh, we had classifiers done for MSO, and I just found that it was way more, you know, I could get just, just very minute um, detections that the classifier wouldn't get, like, and, and I just didn't know if you were finding that your classifiers were working pretty well, or I'll be interested to, to see your final results. So look forward to it. Great, thanks Debbie. We'll keep you posted for sure, yeah. I was gonna propose a question to Merrill and all your folks, I, I know Joe pretty well, but um, so the, the end there, when you've got sort of like your strategic planning, like here's the area cleared and here's the front lines and here's ways to maintain the front lines, that sort of like military management aspect of it is fantastic because it gives managers and conservationists like myself sort of like an idea about, okay, what do we need to do to maintain this? I know it's sort of only a sample size of one, but as you move forward, I think an interesting idea would be to map known bullfrog locations on the landscape and start to predict areas where you know maintaining the front lines would likely be possible or where it would not be possible to try to give managers another leg up by saying like we don't even want to indulge in this particular control project because all of the metrics that we have would predict failure <laughs> like it's not worth it or you know on the other end it's like no we should do this one like this is a good bang for a buck we can we can actually implement these strategies and hold the front line and have good gains for the species of interest. Absolutely, Drew. I think that's, I wanna talk more about that too, but I think that's exactly what we're, we're kind of hoping to do is, um, you know, running those simulations. It's not just how successful are they, but also kind of what's the cost to maintain some of these um, buffer zones and things along those lines. So I think that's absolutely um, what, we'll, what we're hoping to dig into. And then it'll be really cool to see, um, to try to apply that approach, approach elsewhere as well, or think about, you know, we're really doing this for this realistic landscape, but can we move to more generic uh, recommendations that's harder but I think uh, potentially worthwhile yeah Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, we're at the top of the hour um, so I'm going to go ahead and close us out. Um, we hope that uh, thank you all for coming. Um, we hope that you will all be able to join us again uh, next month. Uh, we'll be hearing from Rebecca Best at Northern Arizona University about potential chemical treatments for eradica eradication of crayfish before hearing from Arizona Game and Fish about a project looking at native and non-native fish movement across a rapid at the downstream end of the Grand Canyon. Uh, so please join us then if you can. Otherwise, thank you again to all of our amazing speakers today, um, and I hope everyone has a great week.